I'd now like to introduce a special video that's going to be shared with you all. Blake Expeditions was Sir Peter's vision for an organization to change the way people felt about our water planet. And some of the material that was recorded during Blake Expedition's short two years of work has been archived and resurrected by the Sir Peter Blake Trust. This video is appearing with the courtesy of and support of the original directors of Blake Expeditions, Pippa Lady Blake, Scott Chapman, and Alan Sefton. And we want to acknowledge their generosity in allowing us to view this very important footage. So we will now have the opportunity to hear from Sir Peter himself about the vision he had for engaging people in caring for our marine planet. We have this extraordinary vessel, Seamaster, built to go anywhere in the world where she can float. So anywhere where there's one and a half to two metres of water, this vessel can go there. Doesn't matter whether it's minus 40 degrees centigrade in the Arctic or the Antarctic, or at the top of the Amazon River, we can be there. electronic charting. My family, my kids can call me on the telephone through the satellite. We can send emails, we can send still pictures. We have the latest high definition video equipment you could possibly imagine. We have on board this vessel enough food for approximately 15 people for nine months. We can motor for 10,000 miles. Of course you add the sails and the range becomes pretty much unlimited. So quite a unique vessel. We all live on a water planet, because that's what Earth is. So water is life, that's where life started. It started in the sea, right here. And where there's good water quality, generally life is good. So we are going on a series of expeditions, explorations, adventures, to look at the quality of life around the world as far as water is concerned. Life in on and around the sea, on oceans, rivers, streams. The way we plan to do this is through education, but it's education through entertainment. And about to put the two sides on it. I want to get to every classroom of every school in the world long term. We want you to fall in love with the environment. We want you to have fun with us, to experience the adventure with us, to want to come with us from place to place. We can do a lot. Why bother? It's too important not to, for all of us. Isn't that wonderful footage and wonderful to hear the words directly from Sir Peter? One of the greatest ways we can honor a great New Zealander is to continue on with the work that he started. And our next two speakers are going to give us wonderful examples of work that is doing just that. The first of our speakers, it's my pleasure to introduce to you, is Fire Shelley Campbell, who is currently the Chief Executive of the Sir Peter Blake Trust, and is responsible for leading and implementing its leadership development and environmental programs throughout New Zealand and beyond. Prior to taking up her role in 2010, Shelley was overseeing the health business cases for the Minister of Health Reforms in Auckland. She is a former chief executive of the Waikato Primary Health that provided health services to 315,000 people across the central North Island. Shelley is a board member of the Helberg Foundation, Taipo and Pacific Incorporated. In 2007, Shelley was awarded a Sir Peter Blake Leadership Award 
for New Zealand and was the first person of Māori descent to ever win that award. In 2015, she received the award of Honorary Captain from the Royal New Zealand Navy. Shelley will present to us on how the Sir Peter Blake Trust has taken hold of Peter's mission to create strong young New Zealanders who will make a difference. Please join me in welcoming the wonderful Shelley Campbell. Um, thank you, Marco, for your warm welcome. And it's really fitting that we are here for a discussion around ocean leadership while our friends from the Tara crew are in town. And I'm incredibly heartened that so many people have turned up tonight to share that with us and joined in online as well. So Sir Peter was, for many of us, the ordinary New Zealand guy who taught us the difference that great leadership can make. Most Kiwis know about Peter's sailing achievements and prowess, but for a few minutes I just want to share a little bit about his environmental mission, how the Sir Peter Blake Trust is continuing his legacy here at home, and why it's so critical to involve and upskill our young people in this. So the trust was established in 2004, and the purpose of our trust is to inspire and mobilize the next generation of great Kiwi leaders, adventurers, and environmentalists. So essentially, we want to lift the leadership performance of young Kiwis through our programs and experiences. We want proud Kiwis and future leaders capable of operating at the level that Peter did for our country. And I remember really well about seven years ago when Pippa and the board challenged our team to really step up and be more ambitious about Blakey's legacy. They wanted to reposition the organisation and really revamp environmental education for young people because actually that's what Pete really cared about. And at the time Pippa said, you know, I just want you to move us from beach cleanups to something Peter would be really proud of and something you think if he was still alive today um, that he would be doing. And I do remember thinking at the time, um, wow, that's pretty ambitious for a little charity with four staff and no money. But okay, we're gonna give that a go. So the first thing that we did was we decided to go back and talk to Peter's family and friends and fellow sailors. We spent time with the crew from Seamaster and we looked through thousands, literally thousands of unpublished logs, images and footage of Peter at sea on expeditions from Antarctica to Brazil. The archives gave us real clarity about what Peter really cared about, what he wanted to achieve and why. But we also realized that Peter was ahead of his time. From citizen science, his belief 17 years ago in climate change when most people doubted that it was actually real, and his desire to use high quality communications to get to as many people as he could through his environmental adventures. And while his passion to raise the world's awareness about the changes in our environment was clear, we also faced the challenge that many of our young Kiwi students that we worked with were very young or hadn't even been born when Peter was killed. How were we going to connect to them and ensure that Blakey's legacy was relevant for them? We wanted to create for our country a solid pipeline of talented young environmental leaders, young people ready and able to become great scientists, naval leaders, conservationists, communicators, policy makers and the future leaders of our sustainable businesses and industries for this country. We decided to provide life-changing experiences to young people that would inspire them to want to deliver on Blakey's legacy and that we would do that through adventure, education and leadership development just as he had. So over the next three years we, we pursued three strategies to bed his legacy into New Zealand. The first strategy was to revamp the National Youth Enviro Leaders Forum for 15 to 17 year olds. We decided to take the program out of the classroom and around New Zealand. 
we wanted to showcase our beautiful country to our young people and to examine the critical environmental issues that we're all facing. From pest eradication and ecotourism to climate change and ocean health. We have kayaked in Nelson with orcas. We have ziplined 220 metres above the forest floor in the Mamakus. We have snorkelled in New Zealand's best marine reserves and we've sailed Steinlager down the coast of New Zealand. It's true, mock hijackings by the Navy during this forum are not uncommon. As we help young people learn to adapt to the unknown and to work effectively as teams to build their confidence, their self-belief and their resilience. We teach the delegates how to negotiate with people who think differently than they do and to work with media to tell great stories of environmental action in order to mobilise their peers. Upon leaving this forum, these young people return to their schools and communities ready and equipped to lead their own environmental activities. Our second strategy was to scale what was working, our Blake Ambassadors. We worked to develop a network of partnerships with New Zealand's science and conservation experts to provide 18 to 24 year olds and New Zealand teachers with unique summer intern roles. In the last few years, our Blake Ambassadors have worked in the Catlins on penguin research and rescue, fisheries surveys in the Chatham Rise, studying humpback whales in the Southern Ocean with Niwa, and on wind turbines and restoration projects in Antarctica. Most recently, we had two Blake Ambassadors on board Tara, doing plankton and ocean sampling between Fiji and New Zealand. These young people return even more excited about environmental science as they move on to complete PhDs and lead international science and environmental research initiatives for New Zealand. I wanted to include this side, um, slide because I think this um, saying or this quote of Peter's is definitely the one that resonates most with young New Zealanders today. And for them, they intrinsically understand that their actions every day have a direct impact on the environment. And for that, it gives me great hope about our future. But we still had one strategy to implement, our most ambitious. We wanted to move the trust and young Kiwis into a modern age of ocean exploration. We wanted to attract our brightest and most talented future leaders into science and conservation. Strategy number three was Young Blake Expeditions. The reason it's ambitious, and my board would tell you this, is that we didn't actually own a boat. We didn't employ any staff with experience in planning or leading expeditions. And as a charity, we still didn't have any money. But just like Blakey, we didn't let that stop us. We forged partnerships with the Royal New Zealand Navy, our universities, in Zari, DOC, Niwa, and the Ministries for Education and Environment to give us access to the expertise and resources we needed to put together a deep sea ocean based program. In 2012, we cut Young Blake Expeditions, cut its teeth on a 1,000k voyage on board HMNZS Canterbury to the Kermadex, New Zealand's northernmost marine reserve with 30 young leaders and a full science crew on board. With health and safety at the forefront, our trustees were a little nervous. And this was not assisted by the news that we were taking the 30 voyages swimming with sharks off Royal Island. With the discovery of a new species of shark and a massive underwater volcanic eruption that was photographed by NASA, this voyage certainly delivered on our promise of adventure. Since then, we have undertaken two further expeditions to the subantarctic and Auckland Islands, where our young leaders have worked with scientists to undertake the survey work required for the proposed Blake Station, a new climate and ocean research station for New Zealand. So that gives you a snapshot of our environmental pipeline. Um, and I just wanted to mention as well that in addition to our environmental programs, the Trust also runs about a thousand Leadership Week and Red Sox events in schools and communities across New Zealand. And our, our theme for leadership this year is Believe You Can, 
which of course comes from Peter and the essence of who he was and how he went about his business, but also fitting with Team New Zealand returning uh, with the Cup this week as well, I think. So I just wanted to finish up with uh, several observations around ocean leadership um, and then share with you a video from our Youth Enviro Leaders Forum this year, which was actually in the beautiful Hauraki Gulf. The first observation is that despite the fact New Zealand is an island nation, we still have a bias towards terrestrial conservation. Often resolving issues such as plastic pollution, sustainable fishing and marine reserves can feel too hard. But given the increasing importance of our oceans to sustaining life and the planet, I would offer Blakey's own advice. It's too important not to. New technologies like NZGO's underwater virtual reality experience are helping us to get a better understanding and experience our marine environments in ways that were not previously possible. Secondly, the motivation for change around ocean leadership across the world and actually all cultures is without doubt an intergenerational view and those taking the greatest leadership do so accepting that it is their children and their grandchildren who will see the benefits of their actions today. The new models around eco-based management of our marine environments offer real promise. It is not enough to have great science and decision-making tools around the effective utilisation of our marine resources. We must also engage New Zealanders in discussions around what we value in our oceans, our priorities for use of these beautiful blue spaces, and the trade-offs that we can all live with as Kiwis. We now believe that the trust model to enhance not only young people's knowledge and skills about the marine issues, but also their leadership and confidence to negotiate, influence and mobilise their peers will be critical to New Zealand's ability to create change and manage multiple stakeholder interests as we move forward to resolve complex environmental challenges. Finally, my view is that we cannot engage young people early enough in these discussions, and our efforts to do this through experiential learning will deliver a new generation of ocean leaders for New Zealand, and perhaps the world. We must make space for them in our ocean debates currently in order to prepare them for these future leadership roles. So now I want to share with you uh, a quick video from our Youth and Enviro Leaders Forum. We spent a week out on the Hauraki Gulf. We had 50 bright, young, talented New Zealanders and another five from across the Pacific who joined us. So please enjoy Youth and Enviro Leaders Forum. Thank you. ELF brings together students from all over New Zealand as well as from the Southwest Pacific. And the whole week is about leadership and action and experiential learning opportunities for these young people to become environmental champions. We've given the students a number of activities and events that will challenge them, which allows them to explore their reactions to that and learn a little bit about themselves. It's been incredible in assessing the different ways that people can actually work together and what works, what doesn't work, what works in a different way. Go, get up. Welcome to your early morning activity this morning. It was just a once in a lifetime experience. Not every day you could go onto a Navy base, you could do the things they do, you can use their equipment. One of the things we're doing here in Ngāti Whātua is about trying to create a sustainable urban village. This is the kai that was left over from the hui of 200 people in the weekend. We've got systems in place 
in our nursery, with our compost, our garden, our worm farm and our bakashi system to reduce waste from landfill. Yelf and the Ministry for the Environment have a really close partnership. This year we've got a number of us coming for the week and um, presenting what we do to these students. It's really opened my eyes towards the procedures, legislation and everything like that. I've already seen some Yelf people go back to their own communities and change what they might do in their school in terms of recycling. Others have been involved with us in terms of thinking about policy. My favourite event at Yelf was the microplastics lab and learning about how microbeads and polyethylene really affects plankton. My favourite part of Yelf has been meeting um, so many people who are like-minded. I think I've created lifelong friendships and we have the same realisations that we need something to be done within our environmental community. It's certainly like blown away all my expectations. It's been an incredible week. Each day has hopped the last. We learned about lab work. We learned about policy. We went to field trips, places that I've never been before and learning that they existed. And it's definitely been life changing for me and it has impacted my life so much. Isn't that wonderful? And congratulations to the Sir Peter Blake Trust, to its supporters and all who've contributed to creating that organization that is living Peter's legacy. Blakey would be proud. Another organization that Sir Peter would be proud of is Tara Expeditions Foundation and the connections that run deep through not just the boat, but the Trubay family who have had such a long-standing friendship with Sir Peter over so many years. So it's my privilege to introduce to you for the next presentation, the Executive Director of the Tara Foundation, Roman Trublet. With a double degree in biotechnology and business management, Roman is equally known for his sailing skills and his participation in the two America's Cups that were hosted here in Auckland in the year 2000 and 2003. From 2003 to 2006, he worked for Sir Polex and specialized in polar logistics in the Arctic, Antarctic, and in Siberia. They were involved in the organization of sporting, tourist, and scientific expeditions, but also in the discovery of frozen mammoths. He has been coordinating Tara expeditions since 2004 and has become the executive director of that organization. So Roman is going to give us some insights into how Tara Expeditions has transformed Sir Peter's drive and vision to get people caring about the environment through showing them how beautiful the world is and focusing on scientific research to help combat some of our planet's most pressing environmental issues. And as Peter would say, here's trouble. Roman Trublet. Wow, it's a be back week. The cup, Tara, the master, and myself, <laughs> my dad, some, some part of my crew as well. It's a be back week. So, what a week! Bravo to Team Zealand. It's a, it's a wonderful time to be here, and uh, effectively, with Wayne Walker, two years ago, we planned that. We planned this week. You're good, huh? <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, thank you for your hospitality. Why Tara is, in, is, is, is sailing across the ocean since uh, now 14 years, since now, since Pipa uh, decided to land the boat, uh, to sell the boat to, to my family, to my cousin Etienne Bourgois, who is uh, uh, a crazy guy in the head with a vision, and also Agnès Bay, uh, my aunt, my dad's sister, who we started to, okay, let's take over and let's take the people into the adventure. Let's tell stories about the environment. And at the beginning, it was not much about science. It was just about telling stories. So why the ocean? 
If you look at the planet, this is our planet, and if you look at the, the bow uh, on, on the corner, this is just all, all the air we have on the planet. If you put all this air in a bow, the, the air is such a small boat. But if you do the same with the ocean, the, all the water of the planet fits into this very, very small bowl. And when you know that uh, the life on the planet is coming from the ocean, when you know that the life that sustains us every day, our life support systems, is in the ocean, and when you realize the size of it, you, you say, okay, this is, this is the main compartment of life on the planet, where you find life, it's the biggest 80% somehow of the biosphere, and uh, there's no politician there, there's no voters, there's nobody to vote for rules. So there's a lot to do for the community, for our community as a man being, uh, mankind to, to take care of this and to, to, to study it and to share it. So we did do that over the last, uh, uh, the last 14 years. Uh, we did 11 expeditions. Some were small at the beginning, and, uh, but we did all in all very three big ones, three that is uh, in the wake of the great expeditions of the 19th century, when we were 18th century, when we were uh, discovering the planet, when we were going behind, it was Darwin's time, it was the challenger, it was looking for trade routes, cultures, and now we start with doing these kind of missions, but to study life and to share the ocean stories and the ocean life. So we did three main ones. The first one is a crazy one, the craziest maybe so far. And uh, in the room, we have two, a few, few of my crew who spent uh, 11 months on board the boat during this trip. Uh, and you can see the drift of Tara in, uh, in, uh, in, the pi in the, what is this color, blue. And on the, we, this was done a century after the Fram did it uh, in 1893. And we did cross the Arctic Ocean like that, the boat and the sea, what you see now, the, the boat and the world around the boat was drifting across the ocean 10 kilometers per day without guessing. Well, sometimes it was a bit shaky, but, uh, but and we did study the, 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 the atmosphere, we did study the, the, the ocean below, there's 4,000 kilometers, 4,000 meters below, and we also studied that small varnish of sea ice, which is a meter now, that's been uh, reduced by 70% over the last 30 years. And how this small varnish of sea ice is uh, diminishing over the last, uh, how, where the heats come from. And the heats come from our places, from the south, actually, in the, Arctic, in the Arctic. And you can see that by the water coming in there, heat coming in, and by the, by the, the temperature at the, in the atmosphere. So this middle, piece of ice in the middle is disappearing very fast. And coming back from this expedition that lasts 18 months, a year and a half, Six months in the dark, six months in the day, and six months in the dark again. Uh, minus 30 sometimes, minus 40 mi maximum. We say, okay, what could be the impact of this uh, onto the sea life? Onto, and we, onto what is the basic of the food chain in the ocean, which is the plankton, the microscopic life that you can see on this video. How, how, can, we can, how can we understand this better, this world, this completely amazing world, this beautiful beautiful uh, species and animals, creatures. We did study the planet, we did study this across the planet. We study the biology, viruses, bacteria, microalgae, zooplankton that eats on it, which is the basis of the fish food, in fact. And we studied that in the environment. And we did that across the planet. It was four years in a row. Uh, as you can see here, everywhere, I will be fast on that, and we even sailed across the Arctic, around, around the Arctic Ocean to finish this study. And this was bring 40,000 samples. We do genomics on it, hard science. And when I speak in front of you, it's just not me. <laughs> we have 300 people who, since the 10 years, 14 years, are working to make this happen. So it's a lot of commitments. And these commitments led to a very, very state-of-the-art science. We did uh, nine papers in science journal uh, and in Nature and 120 papers so far on this plankton story, uh, sorry, and, uh, and we also did the cover of uh, science, which is amazing. I don't know how we did that, but we did it. And everywhere we were going on the planet, we were 
fishing plankton. Always is the same work, pretty boring in fact in the end. But uh, it, we were finding plastic as well. And uh, we decided to also do an expedition on the plastic in the Mediterranean Sea at the, as a laboratory. The Mediterranean is very well known, so we tried to tackle this issue. And, uh, and for every bit of, uh, of plankton size, you have the same plastic pieces in the ocean. So this is, this is not, a, not a fate. I mean, this is reversible. If we take action, if we do something, if we stop throwing plastic in the ocean, in 50 years' time from now, we will be in a much better world. So this is just to, and this is really relates our daily life, the plastic we use every day in our kitchen, to the ocean and very far from the ocean. We found plastic in Arctic, in Antarctic, everywhere. So why we are here today is because we are on a project called Tara Pacific. So it's in Japanese because we were in Japan uh, two, three months ago. And we, we, we crisscrossed the, uh, the, the Pacific Ocean uh, for two and a half years. We try to understand how the reef, coral reef behaves, global change, not only climate change, but global change. So doing that, we, we stopped by, the, actually the, the orange track is the first year we did, we're now in Auckland, and uh, we stopped by 18, so far, 18 different islands. We do always the same, we collect the same species, we collect the water around, we try to understand who is working with whom, who is doing what, how this whole ecosystem behaves. And by doing that every way, in the same way, we can able to compare afterwards, crisscross uh, data, and understand new patterns and new adaptation strategies uh, for the future, and how to help in the, fu in the future, how to help the reef to sustain the climate change if we can. So this is a long story, this is a long haul, two and a half years, and the science will be getting out for the next five, six, seven years. And, what, and the beauty of it is that we're going to be able to compare the reef biology with the offshore biology in the same way. We're going to get connectivity and have a bigger understanding of all this. And you know what? About the, this four years project on the, on the plankton, 85% of what we collected is unknown to man. So this is huge. And this is very engaging because there is so much to do so much to discover, so much to tackle, so much scientists, we need young scientists to, to engage with the Black Trust and through many other NGOs across the world. Really, this is, uh, uh, I, mean, I think this is a very great, great challenge to, to, to take. Uh, so doing it across the ocean, we, we, we dive, the crew and the sailors, uh, diving on, on every reef. You got uh, Sam, the captain, he's also a diver and he's diving now, flying a, is a motor, motor scooter across above the reef to collect the plankton, to like what's living on the reef, on top of it. And then we have other uh, divers down on below. One is has a problem with his mask, yeah. But uh, you have other divers that collect pieces of plankton, of, of coral reefs, pumping water around the reef to, to know who's living there. And all this is happening everywhere on the, on, on the ocean uh, over the last year. 2,500 dives so far all safe, and we are going to next year again uh, to do the same across the, the, the Southeast Asia. Um, this is doing the reef. I would like to take you on a journey, uh, so two minutes, three minute journey, to, to really uh, love the, this animal with the, the coral reef. Can you play the video, please? So what you see is the, it's really super macro stuff that has been never been done before. And, uh, and this guy, Pete West from BioQuest, is a just crazy man. And uh, we are uh, working with him since a, a, year, a year already to, 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 to achieve the, this kind of video. So this is science. Uh, there is education, education of kids, of course. And we talked about it a lot with, with Chalet. Uh, also grandkids, they are very important. This is Pete Ban Ki-moon. He had the chance to have him twice on board Tara over the last uh, three, four years. And uh, he was completely moved by what's happening on this boat, the science, the questioning, what, what we know, what we don't know, what we need to know in the future. We need facts. Today we need facts in this world where the US are craziness, craziness to have their own facts. We need scientific facts today. Yeah. I my truth. He has, he has his truth. And this is very important. And, uh, 
and you need to continue the work. And in the future, in the 2020, we already plan to do a next drift across the Arctic Ocean and uh, with a laboratory we're going to have to build. In it's, it's just the beginning of the project and as Peter said, the biggest, the, the, the hardest is to start. So we are now starting to build up this new project to drift across the North Pole and again study the biology over there and try to predict what's going to happen. And if we are here today, because of this man, I think if we, if we got this boat in the family, it's because of this man and he inspired us to do something. So if we are here, it's really a, a great legacy. It was hard to cope with this legacy, uh, but I think we are on a good way and uh, all together. And if we are here, so here it's because of the council support. Thank you very much. The Black Trust, awesome support. And I hope it's the beginning of a long story to be between us. And also because of our great uh, partners of Tara since, uh, since the many, many years. So yes, we can make our planet great again, and we can do it together. Thank you. Uh, bravo, uh, merci beaucoup to uh, Roman and to all the Tara team. As you can see, we've had two presentations which demonstrate for us that the spirit of Sir Peter Blake lives on in the work and the hearts of so many, and that is a wonderful, wonderful way to honor him. Our next presenter and final presentation for the evening is to bring us a little bit more down to home. And this is a person whose career and mine have intertwined on a number of occasions, and I'm delighted to welcome and introduce to you Associate Professor Rochelle Constantine. She is a conservation biologist whose research is primarily focused on cetaceans, and more recently, sharks and seabirds. She heads the Marine Mammal Ecology Group and works on a number of multidisciplinary collaborative projects anywhere between the tropics and Antarctica. She leads an international project on humpback whale connectivity in the Southern Ocean, as part of the Southern Ocean Research Partnership within the International Whaling Commission, dedicated to non-lethal whale research. She is the director of the Joint Graduate School in Coastal and Marine Science between NIWA and the University of Auckland. Rochelle will bring the global picture home for us and will talk about the Hauraki Gulf, what's going on above and below the water, and how our actions can make the difference. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rochelle Constantine. Kia ora, Marco. Um, Marco is one of my great inspirations, and I'm very grateful for many years of friendship with you that continue on. And thank you all for coming here tonight. It's, um, it's always very overwhelming, these events, because you realize that, and as a scientist, we know we always stand on the shoulders of giants. And there are many of you in this room who I know in many different ways, because as a scientist, our work uh, is not, it doesn't exist in isolation, you know, it takes a village. And my, my approach to my research has always been collaborative. Um, it's always been about getting the best people on board to, to, to try and find answers to problems, often to very wicked problems. And certainly, when it comes to marine conservation, there are many wicked problems. So um, tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Te Kapa Moana, Te Moana Nui Atoi, or the Hauraki Gulf. It has many names, it's a big area, and it's actually a really, really important place. It's a, an important place to all of us who live here in Auckland because it's our big blue backyard. Um, many Aucklanders know the edges of it, you know, we dabble in it, we look in the rock pools, but it's actually an enormous area. Uh, from for a marine scientist like myself, it's uh, it's about 4,000 square kilometers of just pure productivity. It's it's a really homogenous environment. It's only about 50 meters deep, pretty much similar benthos, you know, a few islands dotted around, but it is constantly changing. There's this rich seam of cold water and warm water that come through at different times. They come up and over the, the continental shelf and the wind mixes the water and it's always green. And, and in this case, green water is a good thing. <laughs> it's life, 
It's, that's where it all starts. It's the phytoplankton. And, and I'm often asked, you know, oh, Rochelle, what's your favorite marine, you know, marine animal? And because I study whales and dolphins, everyone's like, oh, it'll be a whale. It's actually a coccolithophore. And coccolithophore, I'm not kidding you, I love coccolithophores. Now you need to go and look up what that is. <laughs> it's a very small um, unicellular phytoplankton, but it is a a work of nature that is spectacularly beautiful. And in New Zealand, we have them all around our coastline, massive blooms of them. They can be seen from space. Go look it up, coccolithophore. But in the Gulf, we have massive productivity. We have a rich um, uh, phytoplankton fauna, and of course, in turn, zooplankton, and so on and so on. Many people don't know that the Hauraki Gulf is New Zealand's only marine national park. It's a national park. It's like Tongariro National Park, like Wanganui National Park, like Abel Tasman. And yet most people are like, really? Really? <laughs> but this is it. This is our jewel. It has an act of, of law that protects it. And um, it is truly a, a, a magnificent place. It's a place of great life of all kinds. So I talk a bit about the phytoplankton, and now I'm talked about the zooplankton. And for me, these are the things that we see that inspire me. So in this picture here, we have, there's dolphins down in the bottom of the picture. There are um, shearwaters. Uh, there are some terns in there. Of course, they're the, the gannets that are diving in. And all of this life you can see on the surface is going after the same thing. They're going after fish. They're mostly small pilchards, soury, those kinds of things and a big whale has come right through the middle of it all, a brooder's whale, and taken a giant gulp out of, out of the way of all of those other things that are picking off one fish at a time. You know, these 15 meter long whales, brooder's whales, this uh, is, is a, a species that I've studied for some time here in the Gulf. But everything that you see on the surface is only a fragment of what's going on because underneath there, there are big schools of fish and they're feeding on the different zooplankton. And then there are sharks under there. And then there are larger fishes that are eating the smaller fishes and so on and so on. And this happens every day in the Gulf, all the time, constantly. It is such a place of great productivity. And it's a place uh, that is you know, quite a fascinating environment because not only do we have the stuff we see on the surface and the life that lives in it, but it's also a place of many sounds. I'm involved in a research project with my colleague, we have a, a PhD student who's, who's about to finish, about the soundscape ecology of the Gulf. Now, I don't think you probably think much about what, is the, what does the water sound like? Mostly, at best, we sit on top of it, often with our fishing rods or on our boats and we sort of bob around. Occasionally, we get in there. Occasionally, we might you know, snorkel or dive. But it is so noisy. There is the noise of, of small um, uh, geological events, small earthquakes, you can hear those in our hydrophone arrays. There's also the, the dawn and dusk chorus. It's a massive amount of noise, and that's mostly the kinna, the urchins going <coughs> They go crazy, dawn and dusk. For some reason, they all like rattle their spines, groove around, do their thing. We don't know why. At nighttime, you hear these really unusual sort of deep pop, 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 kind of sounds, and those are the big eye fish venturing out of their caves at nighttime, and they go pop, pop, pop as a kind of, I'm here, oh yeah, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, and they just, you know, pop, 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 and move around, staying in contact with each other as they venture at nighttime out of the, the sh their, their very, you know, um, safe environment. You also have the deep croakings of gurnards and all the other fishes. You have the whistles and, and, and the um, echolocations of the dolphins, who also have this, the common dolphins in particular, have this very active period around dusk. For some reason, they all come alive. I think it's because the, f the nighttime fishes are waking up and the daytime fishes are going to sleep, and the dolphins are making the most of that. And you have the low, very, very, very boring moans of the brooders whales as well. But also over this, there is a lot of noise that's made by us. There's ship noise and boat noise, the high whine, the squeal of an outboard engine, and the noise of ships. Now, our big blue backyard is in our biggest city, Auckland. It's also our biggest port. And so we have a really big challenge there because that low frequency sound goes for miles and miles. And we did some tagging of these brooders' whales and uh, suction cup tags that recorded every sound they heard. And in 62 hours of recording, there were very few minutes where we didn't have boat noise in the background. 
And that boat noise is exactly the same frequency that the whales use to communicate with each other. And that is of concern to us. But what was of more concern, of greater concern to us, was that in around the mid, early mid-2000s, we noticed that we were having a lot of these whales wash up on our shores. Now, Bruder's whales in the Hauraki Gulf, it's about one of only three coastal populations of the species in the world. We don't know very much about them because they weren't heavily hunted. Unlike most whales, they don't go down to the polar regions. They just stay year-round in the Gulf. So we have these whales here year-round, 15 meter long, big baleen whale, eaten all the time out in the Hauraki Gulf. And they're usually alone. They're usually just doing their thing. But what we found out is that they were being hit by ships as ships were coming and going. And this provided for us an immense challenge. Because what do you do when you've got shipping, which is the lifeblood of New Zealand, it's moving products into and out of. It's a massive commercial venture. Most of the shipping is global. You know, these are the big companies, Hapag Lloyd, you know, Maersk, all the, the big names that we know that are global. And so we were faced with a really big problem because the Bruder's whale population, the sort of those that are pretty much resident in the Gulf year round in the broader region, there's about 60 whales and we were having between two and three whales killed every year by ship strike alone, which is about the same rate as their natural mortality. So we were staring down a really big problem that we might lose these whales. So my, I guess I, I'm, I'm one of those people who don't like problems, I really like solutions. You know, problems annoy me and I like to find solutions to them. And so my first inclination was like, well, what are we gonna do? Who needs to know? And we got a bunch of people together and we sat down and we said, right, what's going to happen here? And the industry, of course, is like, well, we can't slow down, you know, we've, we've got schedules to keep to, blah, blah, blah. You know, we, the, I'm sure this isn't a problem. I'm like, yeah, it's a problem, here's some science. And they're like, ah. Oh. So then we went back to the table and they said, well, this is how much money it's gonna cost us to slow down. I'm like, oh, really? Okay, well, that's a bit of a shame because that means you valued whales' lives, you know, and it was a, around about, I think, five to about eight million dollars a year. So each whale, you kill two whales a year, is worth about two and a half, give or take, to four million dollars. That's the price of a brood as well. Whoa, steady on. It was one of those moments where we kind of all realized that our currencies were different. You know, what we were discussing and what needed to happen was different. And so what we did is we sat down, we hashed it out, we talked a lot, we agreed to be uncomfortable, we agreed to disagree, but we agreed that we had to keep going because we had one common thing, we didn't want dead whales. No one wanted to kill whales. And that was the thing ar around which the whole conversation went. In two and a half years, we solved the problem. The shipping industry developed a voluntary transit protocol themselves, and from two and a half years from the beginning of our conversations, they uh, uh, announced this, uh, the transit protocol for commercial shipping. It took them a, you know, sort of a year or so to get into it and to actually start slowing down. But now, for the last two and a half, almost three years, they've been sailing at about 10 knots through the Hauraki Gulf, completely voluntary, all off their own bat, and just doing the right thing. And the last dead whale we had was in September 2014. And that, I think, is the spirit of leadership that everything that we've had, yeah. And the leadership came from us as a group. It didn't come from me. It didn't come from each of the owners of the shipping companies. It came from us as a group. And that collaborative approach is what solved the problem. And you know, I could not be more proud of these guys because they just do it because it's the right thing to do. We face other challenges in the Hauraki Gulf, the same as the global ones. You know, this, these wicked problems don't stay away from our Gulf. We are affected by climate change. We know that our weather events are getting bigger and more extreme. A couple of summers ago, pretty much all the whales and birds and everything just moved right out of the Hauraki Gulf. It was too hot. It was just too warm for them. And they moved because it was too hot for the plankton. So the plankton moved and the whales moved. They follow their food. And we are, you know, facing these challenges. We're clearly facing challenges of plastic pollution. There's not one single one of you that can walk on any one of our beaches here and not find some plastic on it which is really sad. We have some amazing organizations, the Sea Cleaners, uh, Sustainable Coastlines, a couple of examples, and there are hundreds and hundreds of volunteers who have removed over six million liters 
of mostly plastic rubbish off around our coastline in this region. Six million liters, it's ridiculous. And they mostly focus on the big stuff. This is a terrestrial problem. Plastic is a terrestrial problem. It's our problem. These are our choices. And every single one of us needs to show our own leadership in thinking about plastic and use and disposal and where it goes. Because these kinds of scenes of birds, there's, not, there's no wildlife at all in the ocean, from the smallest, smallest of animals to the very largest of animals that are not affected by plastic. And this is our personal challenge, I think, in the Gulf that we need to take on. We also need to think about in the Gulf the way we fish. And, you know, fishing is, is, you know, has become a real kind of, oh, the recreational, ah, oh, the commercial, ah. Oh. There are no sides in fishing. There are just fish. There are these, these fish uh, populations that we have in the Gulf that, that live only over a reef. That is their home. They know every part of that reef. And we bob around on top. We chuck our line over. We hook them out. You know, that might be a 40-year-old snapper who settled there quite young, knows all the where to get the best kinna, where to go, where its favorite kelp is, how to hide, hello to the spotty, you know, g'day to the little you know, leather jacket that goes by. Foo, we pull it out. We eat it. Nice. In fact, sometimes we don't even eat all of it. We need to think about that. We need to think about what we're doing to our golf. We need to protect its sediments, the benthos, the life-rich benthos, it often just looks like sand and mud, but there is so much life. There are thousands of different species that live in the benthos. And so we need to think about what we're doing and how we interact with the Gulf. We've had some really fantastic initiatives been taken in identifying problems. This is the, the last of the uh, State of Our Gulf um, uh, reports. And they, they you know, came to that point where they recognized there was a problem. And they had some very clear guidelines of things that we need to do. This is our golf. This is our golf that we're talking about. And it is on all of us to think about how we can actually enact this and ensure that we, we move forward to a much better place uh, than we currently have. No, it's not a big disaster, but it's not, it's not all good. And there are many things that we can do. We also have uh, the sea change, Taitimu Taipari, process, which is a, now a, a framework for moving forward and, and actually making difference. It's a bit stuck at the moment. You know, it's stuck in, for poli political reasons, and we need to unstick that. I think us as Aucklanders need to just keep going because this is our golf. It's not Wellington's golf. It's our golf, and we need to think about what we want that to look like, and there are many ways we can achieve that. In summary, I mean, I am... I guess the, the Hauraki Gulf is every uh, message that Roman talked about that's global is in our backyard here. And I think that we can make change. All of the organisms that live there, from the largest whale to the smallest little kukulithophore, this is their place too. And I've had a lot of conversations recently with people about, why don't we just change our way of thinking about it? It's not our Gulf. It's all of the organisms that live in the water. It's their golf. And if we think of our actions and what that does to them, then maybe, maybe we can just move forward and own it and take leadership over our own lives, but over looking after the golf for now and forward. Thank you. and thank you Rochelle for such a powerful presentation and for reminding us of a number of things that are important. Firstly that conversations are important, courageous conversations, conversations with people who see the world differently but a commitment to continue to persevere and through those conversations to try and find a way forward that is better. That is part of what we are moving to now. I'd also like to reflect on two very powerful presentations from Roman with regard to Tara Expeditions Foundation and from Shelley Campbell with regard to Blake, Sir Peter Blake Trust and the work that they do and the difference that they are making. So as we move into our question session, I'd like to invite both Roman and Shelley back onto the stage to join Rochelle here.